Welcome to my program, Bash's Corner. In this program, we invite guests from all sections of the society, politicians, cultural personalities, authors, academics, intellectual, sport personalities. We have a lovely talk with them and discuss those issues which normally mainstream media doesn't bother or doesn't wish to talk about. Today, my guest is a very, very special person, Professor Akbar Ahmed. He's world's best known scholar on Islam. He has written many, many books. I can't even name all of those. But the most important one is Discovering Islam, Making Sense of Muslim History and Society. And that, was, that book was the basis for a six-part BBC TV series called Living Islam. Professor Akbar is now Ibn Khaldun Chair of Islamic Studies and Professor of International Relations at American University in Washington, D.C., USA. He was a High Commissioner of Pakistan to UK. He has been also a prominent politician in, in different parts of Pakistan. And amazingly enough, on the issue of Islam, he advised, or he advises still, Prince Charles and President Bush. His film, Jinnah, The Life of Founder of Pakistan, won many praises and awards, and many Pakistanis, including myself, are very grateful that he is the one who produced the, the story of the man who gave Pakistan to the world. Welcome to my program, Professor Ahmed. Now, First of all, thank you for granting me this interview. I tell you honestly that I'm very uh, thankful that a man of your eminence comes to uh, our studio and will give us time. As I said in my introduction, you are very well known throughout the world uh, on the issues of Islam. You have done a lot of research. You have made films. You have written books. What made you interested in this difficult task, thankless task? Uh, Bashi, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me. I know what a big star you are and the role you are playing in helping to make people understand each other and different positions, trying to bridge these different positions. Uh, I've been a long, long and admirer of your work and, and we met uh, two decades ago when I came to this beautiful city of yours. So I'm delighted to be back and in Bashi's corner. Thank you. Well, this um, desire to really understand culture, faith is something that was innate me, in me even as a, as a student in, at university many, many years ago. And it just continued. Okay. So for me to understand faith, culture, how people interact, and looking at it through the prism of my own faith and my own culture um, always gives me the incentive to know other people in a better way and in a better light. You, um, as an academic, uh, you have a PhD in anthropology and you have also done a lot of other uh, studies. And as I said, uh, you have been political, um, uh, you have been commissioner, you have been political agent in North Waziristan of all the places. And can academia and politics mix together? Well, Bashi, in the old days, as you know, in the tradition of the finest civil servants of the old British Raj, a tradition that continued into Pakistan, academic work and political administration, not politics, but political administration, in fact, merged. Yes. You cannot be a good administrator without knowing mm -hmm. the people that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was a very natural bridge. Now, uh, you have published, I think, about 23 books, if I can correctly remember. Uh, you have written about Pashtun tribes, uh, you have written about sociology of change in Pakistan and discovering Islam. So I'm just wondering that this change uh, shift from politics to religion, what does that? It's not so much politics to religion, Bashi, it's different fields within society. Looking at administration, which you could call politics, political administration, and then looking at how people interpret religion and Islam. Mm -hmm. And after 9-11, this became an urgent question yes. because so many people had so many different interpretations of Islam, a whole range of people. And this concerned everyone on the planet because of 9-11. Sure. The debate became global. 
and therefore for me as a scholar it became important to add my very small voice to this debate. Uh, so my attempt became my attempt be became a, an attempt to in fact create a global frame within which to understand relations between the West mm -hmm. and the world of Islam. Okay. And for this I did four big projects. One was Journey into Islam, looking at the Muslim world. I went to the Middle East, South Asia, Far East Asia with a group of young scholars and students. Sure. The second one was based in America, looking at Muslims in America, which resulted in the book Journey into America. The third was looking at tribal societies, mm -hmm. the interstices, those areas between states. Yeah. When I looked at tribal societies like the Pakhtun, Yomini, Somali, and I wrote the book, The Thistle and the Drone. Oh. And this fourth project, Journey into Europe, looks at Europe and through the prism of the Muslim community, but also looking at the past, where Muslims had an interaction with Europe mm. in the West, in Spain, in Andalusia, and later in the East through the Ottomans. So this allows us then to look at the whole picture through a historical frame and then relate it to what is happening in Europe today. But talking about Islam, uh, since the early 90s, I can, uh, I can see that you have done a lot of research, you have written a lot, as you just explained, on the issues of terrorism, on tribalism, uh, radicalization, uh, and of course, on Islamic or Muslim communities all over the world. My question is, why so much focus on Islam? I'm looking at the community. So not so much Islam, the religion, okay. Okay. but Muslims, the community. All right. Uh, you have, as I said, you have also advised uh, Prince Charles and President Bush. What do you say to them? Well, in their time, in the place, uh, when I was in Cambridge many, many years ago, in the early 90s, I had the uh, pleasure of uh, meeting and being able to talk to uh, Prince Charles and I found him a very sympathetic, very intelligent uh, person, very c concerned about improving relations between mm -hmm. communities. Mm -hmm. He d really has a very strong feeling to bring peoples together. Uh, President Bush, I was invited after 9-11 uh, several times to the White House. I had the privilege of attending the iftar dinners that uh, he gave for the Muslim community. And of course, I can always offer my opinion, which I've done, mm -hmm. whether at the Pentagon, the White House, or the State Department, or university campuses as a scholar. And then people have other voices, so mine becomes one of many voices. I believe, because of my experience in Waziristan, my experience in the tribal areas, that I'm bringing something which I hope will make people understand the world today in a little bit uh, more sophisticated way. But in the West, there is this deep perception about Islam uh, that Islam and West are not compatible. Now, you suggest actually, on the contrary, you talk about a dialogue and you talk of accommodation and coexistence. Is it at all possible in today's world? It is, Bashi, and it must be because human societies have to learn to live with each other, to respect each other. And there have been centuries when Muslims and non-Muslims have coexisted and amicably. Uh, Andalusia is one good example, which is a European example, mm -hmm. where for centuries Jews, Muslims and Christians lived together in harmony. Under Muslims. Under well, the Muslims then, but the Jewish Prime Minister and the Archbishop, who was the Foreign Minister, confirmed that this was an interfaith community. Okay. And I think that that kind of ideal that existed in Europe is reflected again and again in so many parts of European society. In England, for example, you may have a, something like a dozen members of the House of Lords and House of Commons who are Muslim, mm -hmm. and so on. There are many, many examples. In uh, Copenhagen, I've met some very prominent Muslims. I met the senior figure in the IBM, uh, Muslim female, uh, Ms. Rana. I met your counselor, Mr. Rizvi, and so many other people I met yes. with you at your meeting. Muslims and immigrants who are doing very well in this country. This is the first generation. Yes. The next generation, hopefully, will be even more successful and better integrated. Your message of hope and existence, of course, is much needed and we appreciate that very much. But do you think that the Western media and the populist politician would allow that? Are they listening? Well, this is a big challenge, Bashi. It's a big question and a big challenge. I hope that they will listen. It's important that we request them to listen. It's important that voices like yours, you also have a media, it's a very powerful platform. These voices carry to them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you get one image, one view, one monolith. 
and there's no dialogue then. It's an asymmetrical dialogue. So it's really important to have this dialogue in order to improve relations. I call it a monologue what is happening today. It's a monologue, exactly. You need a dialogue. Exactly. On 1st November this year, uh, you wrote a very nice article uh, in Washington Post and the article says European Muslim feel under siege. Actually not you didn't write but somebody else. Uh, you have been traveling in Europe now for, for a while. Uh, you came to Copenhagen and your latest project is about a film and a, and, and a book. Um, what is your assessment after all the traveling and talking with different communities? What is your assessment in which direction are we going? Well, um, Bashi, that's, that's a fascinating question because I haven't really answered it yet. I'm in the middle of field work. But it's a sophisticated picture because you see the relationship between Islam and Europe and Spain is old. It's exactly. nuanced. Mm. It's complicated. So when I went there, I felt I've come home. When I went to Bosnia and the Balkans, again, I felt I'd come home because there was so much symbolism of the Ottomans that still lives. Outside my window in Sarajevo, I was at the Orient yes. Hotel. I looked out and there was a minaret and the dome of the main mosque. Yes, and I heard the azan. Uh, that's Europe. Then I come to Denmark. Of course, Denmark has no such history with Islam. No. It's a new community here. So there are different kinds of challenges. Mm. So you can see that even within Europe, the relationship with Islam is very, very different in each country. Overall, I would say that the Muslim community is just coming of age. It is facing challenges. As you said, there are right-wing movements, there are Islamophobes, all kinds of people. But there are also people who believe in dialogue, who believe in harmony, who believe in bringing people together. I had the pleasure of interviewing the former chief rabbi of Denmark, uh, a very wise man, a uh, great spiritual leader. Ben he was, Misha. yes, uh, your, your, your colleague and friend. He was full of hope and very inspiring and he was full of optimism. Mm. So there are people who are promoting this kind of dialogue and interaction. And I think that at this moment in time, I would say we are at a crossroads in Europe. It can go one way or the other. And I hope that those people who are promoting dialogue and harmony will succeed. Coming back to the, the, the present project, uh, Muslims in Europe, how did it come about? It came about as a logical sequence. We had looking at the Muslim world, mm -hmm. then looking at Islam in America, okay. then looking at tribal societies, and then looking at Islam in Europe. So it's a very logical sequence if we are to understand relations between the West and the world of Islam. And Europe completes that picture. Now, but now you have been in Denmark for a few days and um, talking to a lot of people. Why did you choose Denmark and not Sweden? Because it's much more progressive. Yes, it, it, it was a big choice. We had to decide uh, Sweden or... Well, I must say that uh, I had been to Denmark. I loved coming to Copenhagen when I came and I met you then. And of course, I fell in love with Denmark. It's such a beautiful country. They're very, very fine people, very civilized people. And who could resist the Little Mermaid? That's true. Now I want to come to a point which we are always discussing in, in Europe. This is a question of terminology. Um, when I look at the media and, and, and the popular discourse, uh, the word Islamist and Islamism springs in my eyes, you know. Uh, and they use it right from President Erdogan of Turkey, who is elected leader, to Tariq Ramadan, uh, one of your colleagues, they use it same for Boko Haram and anybody in between. Uh, what are the reasons for this kind of mindset? Why do they use this? I think, Bashi, this is called lazy thinking. They take some term, some new term, someone comes up with a new term, and they suddenly begin to apply. It means nothing. What does it mean? What is fundamentalism? What does that mean, a fundamentalist? Every Muslim, by definition, is fundamentalist. But he is not a terrorist or an extremist, mm -hmm. which have very different meanings in a Christian concept. Fundamentalist is a word coming out of the Christian tradition. Yes. So we have to be very careful about taking terms and applying them out of context. And there is a problem here in terminology. We have all these new terms coming out, Islamicist or jihadists or fundamentalists, which mean very, or moderate Muslim. This means very little in the Muslim world. Because, because my research tells me that the word Islamist does not exist. It in, doesn't mean anything. In Islam yeah. or, or even in literature. Yeah. The second uh, terminology I would like to have your expert opinion is the word jihadist. Now, um, can you tell us, our, uh, our viewers, what does the word jihad mean? Is, does it mean holy war and cutting of heads? 
Jihad simply means to struggle. And the jihad, the real jihad, the big jihad, as defined by the Holy Prophet of Islam, is the jihad to improve yourself spiritually. Nothing to do with war. Nothing to do with war, to elevate yourself spiritually, to fast, to do good deeds, to be a good human being. The lesser jihad is to defend yourself when you are attacked. So it's got nothing to do with war or off offensive war at all. But it's been used just like It now. is. It's being used and misused. And yeah. people immediately say anything that a Muslim does is jihad. So it's again being used, distorted, twisted. And I think scholars have to step back and explain it. Thank you. Um, there are many international surveys uh, and reports about Islamophobia in Europe. Um, and it's very docu well documented. Have during your um, travels and, and research, have you recognized this development? Yes, uh, I have recognized this. I have written about it. I've sometimes been uh, a target of it. So it, it, it exists. It's a reality. It's mm. like people saying, I don't like you because I don't like the color of your skin or I don't like the, the, your religion or your mm. uh, personality. It's human nature. And again, it's a reality and Muslims must deal with it. They must respond to it with scholarly objectivity. They must not get angry or violent or emotional. They have to understand why it is happening and how to challenge it. But what Muslims should do is one thing. But when in the West Islam is connected with terrorism, with extremism, with jihadism as they say, and directly that they say that Prophet Muhammad and Islam teaches, teaches violence, uh, uh, are they justified what you're saying? I think, Bashi, that's also a moment for Muslims to use that opportunity to explain the Prophet and explain Islam. I've written books on this, I've made films on this, and people have read them and people have appreciated them. Mm -hmm. I think this is the job of Muslim scholars and commentators like you to continue explaining to non-Muslims. A lot of non-Muslims who genuinely want to understand are confused and would like, like to know. I'm not talking about those people who say, okay, we hate Islam, whatever the case. Mm. But there are people who want to understand and they're confused. Like so many young Muslims are confused. Yes. So it becomes important in this day and age when there's such high emotions around Islam for us to explain it. And one shouldn't give up. No, no, one should not give up at all because if you give up, it'll just get worse. Mm. I mean, in some senses, you know, when you look at the world today, it's in flames. It's, there's a fire, a raging fire. Sure. So you can't just abandon yeah. the world. You have to try to put out that fire. Recently, you wrote an article uh, says, why are European Muslims joining ISIS? Uh, and you explain some factor. What are those factors? Well, there are several factors. I wrote the article for the Huffington Post and several other papers. Yes. Uh, one of them is, of course, uh, confusion. One of them is the tribal basis within Iraq and Syria. Mm -hmm. One of them is the attraction that sometimes the young have to go and fight for a cause and they think this is a cause they're fighting in Iraq's case against the central government in Syria against Assad's government mm. so they believe they're fighting for that cause uh, to help the Muslim Ummah some of them are just misguided so there are many many factors it's not simplistic and again the fact that ISIS is killing people beheading people means that there is a lot of confusion around the idea of Islam itself if that is Islamic behavior to them I don't think that's Islamic behavior at all. So how can we stop it? Again, we have to talk about it, expose it, talk to the young Muslims who are in fact being fascinated mm. by something like ISIS and help them understand what is really going on. When I speak with uh, people with Muslim background, they say ISIS was actually funded and, and started by, by the Western powers, you know. How much truth is there? Well, Bashi, I've heard that myself. And one of the things that puzzles me, and I wrote this in my book, The Thistle and the Drone, mm. is the confusion around these movements. Mm. There's, there's a thick fog of confusion around them. So you don't know who started it. There's very little information. You don't hear from the actors themselves. Other people are commenting on them. And again, we have to cut through this fog and try to understand on the ground what is the reality. Apart from academics and intellectuals like yourself, can religious leaders also play any part in that? They have to play a part because so far religious leaders have been confined to the mosque to prayer mm. and they've sort of switched off. They've said this is nothing to do with us. But in fact it's like a fire. Mm. When there's a fire in the house it affects every room in the house. So they cannot abandon the role 
of being spiritual leaders because they've been switched off so many young men mm. have gone off to fight some kind of a jihad got themselves in trouble and got their families in trouble and got the community in trouble and many got killed and many got killed so the spiritual leaders must be involved in guiding the young not to destroy their lives your forthcoming book uh, journey into europe deals with immigration it deals with islam and also empire there are three different subjects how do you put them together they are related each one of these you'll notice related to mm. the other so muslim migrants coming to europe that is islam these are coming as muslim migrants empire because there's a pattern in immigration in europe yes algerians coming to france south asians pakistanis bangladeshis coming to england mm -hmm. Uh, Germans receiving the Turks, guest workers. Yes. So you can see a pattern in each one of these countries because of the relationship in the 20th century of empire. Now, keeping in mind the socio-economical problem, because Islamophobia has not only had scarf and beards and, and minerals, you know, it's also socio-economical issues, uh, political populism, media discourse, um, are you optimistic that in the end um, things will change in the right direction? In the Muslim world? In Europe. In Europe. I think they will. I think they're already moving in a certain direction. I've met a lot of young people. I've been very impressed by a lot of people who, mm -hmm. in, in very difficult circumstances, being a, uh, a migrant, being a refugee is always a challenging position. It's not easy. You uproot from one society, you come to another, learn a new language, learn new culture. But I'm very encouraged to see how Muslims are adapting here, how the migrant has learned the language, learned to be part of this culture, learned to feel and be proud of being Danish and being proud of being Muslim. That is the secret. Both of them, both identities merging and saying, I'm proud of both. After so many years of research, filmmaking, writing, do you ever think of retiring and taking up gardening? <laughs> Bashi, as long as you take a look at the Muslim world, the answer is no, you can't. Because really, there's so few of us that it would be, I think, a crime to just sit back and say, okay, I have nothing to do with it. So you've got to keep going because any time you can do a little bit of good, even a tiny bit of good, we all hope and assume we can contribute, we should really contribute. So gardening must be postponed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bashi. Professor Thank Akbar, you. and I hope that, and I'm sure that our viewers have listened to your wise words and their horizon have broadened. Until next week, see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rashid.